Welcome to another episode of the Ride and Inspire Rawcast. Today I'm taking you on a walk right behind my house at the Costa Blanca on a beautiful, beautiful sunny day here in February with birds chirping and the sun warming my skin while I walk the same trails I usually ride with my bike. So in case the noises are molesting you, then take your ear pods, go on a walk with me and just imagine we're out walking together. So the trails I'm riding, no, not riding, I'm walking on, they're super rocky and they're loose and some of them are super steep. The type of trails actually many riders fear, and I used to fear a lot as well, as the trails have very, very little grip and they have a lot of exposure, super gnarly sections and loose kind of baby doll head sized rocks as well. So overall, they are hard to ride and very hard to ride and control. So in case you're new here, in this raw cast, I share my thoughts and experience teaching mountain bike skills and working as a mental trainer and as a psychological counselor. And I bust myths about skills and I talk about common misconceptions with the goal of contributing to mountain biking community and the goal of improving the overall level of what coaching actually is. In short, I just want to make mountain biking safer and more fun because isn't it what that's about? By sharing how we can all safely and realistically progress our skills as an adult. If you want to support this podcast, then you can give me a rating on your podcast app or my podcast site. I'd really love that. And you can, of course, share it with others because that way you can contribute to making mountain biking safer as well. Also, it's not monetized, so check the description if you want to support me for not playing ads. Today, I want to talk about fear on trails. And the most common reasons I see for fear when I'm working with my clients, and of course, how you can ease fear. And also, I want to touch on topics like fear of failure and fear of heights, but I'd say that's a topic for a different a podcast. If you're interested in that, then definitely uh, drop me a line or get in touch. Also, I want to talk about a few differences I've observed between men and women in the last years, because after all, I coach online and in person daily. I work with over, I'd say about 800 to 1000 riders per year, which gives me a lot of insight. And to be honest, my experience in real life are very, very different from what I see on social media, well, what we all see on social media, I would say, on YouTube and what we read in forums, if you're on there. A few main differences between real life and social media, in my experience, are um, one is the level of skills, like the writing level, that's commonly showcased on social media. They're like in no way a representation of the skill level of the majority of writers. Something that is like totally normal and probably even boring on socials is actually way, like way, way, way out of the ordinary in real life. And so I believe we often get desensitized or is that desensitized? Hard to pronounce. I'm not a native speaker, so sorry. So we get desensitized on how advanced the skills showcase on social media actually are in real life and we also we almost never see how long it takes and how much time it takes people to learn them. The second main difference is that the skills people actually want to learn in real life are super different from the skills people on social media click and the reels that go viral and everything they are very different to what people actually want to learn. So if I see what kind of watches and clicks ginormous jumps and other crazy tricks get or manuals, wheelies, etc. And then compare it with what my clients actually want to and what they are able to learn. There's like a huge gap. And the third main difference is what looks super easy on social media is super scary for most writers in real life. Cameras just flatten out everything. And that's something I just wanted to say because it's been coming up in my social media feed in the last weeks. And I think it is, it is important for all of us to acknowledge the gap and also to, well, to know that fear on trails is very common, but there is a way out. And that's what this episode is about. 
So let me give you a little background about the clients I work with because you may recognize yourself here. The majority of my clients is 35 plus and my oldest client is 84, isn't that amazing? And I'd say my average client is, if I'd paint like an avatar of my average client, is a 45 to 50 year old rider with one or two kids, with a good job, with responsibilities, a high intelligence, and enough self-reflection to notice that learning skills will actually help with a lot of things in life. And I have about 50% male and 50% female clients, which is a very high rate of women, if we look at the industry, where women are still highly underrepresented. But actually, I'm amazed at the high rate of men, because 50% male riders wanting to work on their mental strength, on their skills with a female coach and actually having the openness to regress to progress and to go slow to go fast, which I always promote, is a lot. And I'm super grateful and proud of this high portion of male riders working with me. So yeah, big props to you guys. It is amazing. So as I said, today is about fear, fear on trails. And I want to share a few insights um, for the most common causes I see for fear on trails and of course what you can do to feel less of it. So the most common cause for fear I see in most riders is that their subconscious is sensing something that their conscious mind is not aware of. So the thing is your brain is a super computer and it can calculate the most viable future scenario in literally milliseconds. How does it do so? by using a method called duration, path, and outcome. So how long will it take me to do what I want to do? How will I get there? And what's the most likely result? To do this, it will gather information from the past. It will look at past experiences and trauma, at your resources, and then it will calculate. And it usually errs on the side of safety. After all, our brain is programmed for survival. That's like its main goal, its main task is that you survive. So it's always safer to run from a squirrel a hundred times when a squirrel was causing a rustle in the, bush, in the bush, sorry, than to ignore the rustle and to miss running from a hungry lion only once, right? And that's why your brain has this security, that's called buffer in, and it will run from the squirrel again next time and um, just not to miss that line. Here's a fun fact that's actually pretty important to know. Our brain hasn't evolved much since about 80,000 years, but life has changed a lot in that time. So we tend to be in a constant alarm state nowadays with all the apps, the news, the drama, and the hustle culture nowadays. So our brain tends to be very alert because we're not actually made for the long periods of stress. We're actually made for the opposite. We're actually made for long periods of rest and short periods of stress. And nowadays it's exactly the opposite. So we have long periods of stress and very short periods of rest. So I'm not gonna talk about this in detail today because I already have another episode about that, which I'm gonna link below, but it's just interesting and, and important for us to know that our brain is usually in a state of over arousal. So what we really need is more activities that calm us down, more activities that bring us towards that long periods of rest. And many people actually take the things that are harming them in real life and then they just transfer them to biking. So they start taking the stressy lifestyle and then go out and stress themselves even more out on the ride or when they're already stressed, then they go out riding. And then as they are already in the stressful state, if they enter a trail and your brain is sensing just a slight bit of danger, it might overreact because your brain knows, okay, wow, too much overload. And that's also an important topic to have in mind. So back to the real topic, if you have a brain, well, let's call it a healthy brain with a healthy fear function, it will look at step one, how much fitness reserves and strengths do I have today? 
So what are my resources at hand and will they be enough to handle the task? Then step two is how many times have I done what I want to do and how many, well, how did my last tries go? And do I have a plan B if my plan A doesn't work out? And then step three is how high is the chance that I'll get hurt, embarrassed, or ex experience some sort of failure? And that's very dependent on how you define failure. So actually, the more fear of failure you have, the more cautious you'll become because you don't want to fail. And that's also something important to keep in mind. So let's make this relatable to mountain biking. Say you want to ride a rocky, long, steep section and your brain will first check the resources at hand. So one, how much strength do I have? Am I well nourished? Have I slept well? Do I feel fit enough to do this today? Do I have the skills to do this? Have I ridden similar steep sections? Have I ridden loose stuff? Have I been able to control my speed on them? Did I feel good on them? Have I slipped? Did it hurt? How did it feel in general? So it will really tap into that feeling of past experiences and look into the resources you have at hand on that specific day. Then two, it will look, how many times have I done something similar and what was the outcome? So do I have a plan B if plan A doesn't work out or if something unprecedented occurs? If I slip, how will I react? Have I automatized the skills I need to perform even if I get scared? Will I be able to abort safely if I can't ride it? Or will I get hurt? And the older you are, by the way, the more negative experiences your brain has to look back upon, so it will naturally get more fearful. This is normal. And then number three is, if I do slip, crash or fail, how will I, it feel? Will I get hurt? Like how big are the chances of me actually getting hurt? And if the brain decides, it will, that it will experience a negative feeling or pain, it will probably give you a fear response. The fear response, however, will be experienced very differently from person to person. Because when feeling fear, our brain basically has only three options. It's either, either freeze, fight, or flight. And we choose one of these three subconsciously based on our experience and uh, so it's very individual from person to person and also there's a big difference between men and women because men are stronger so they have more resources available for their step one and also men are biologically the hunters so they tend to fight rather, rather than freezing or fleeing so applied to mountain biking this means that men tend to let go of the brakes and try to ride it out when fearful and I already have a full episode about this. I'm going to link it below as well. And women tend to either freeze or flee. So they sit back or they lose control. Well, because they sit back or they brake and get off and walk the bike. So that's usually if you're fleeing or freezing for women, it's usually that. Although the same response, the fear was there in the beginning, just women and men often react differently. And actually both reactions are super smart. So the man just charging at it, letting go and holding on to the bike, it works out for a very long time. And women not riding it and getting off is also smart because women just don't have as much strength. So the chances of them not being able to hold on to their bike and not being able to somehow ride it out. And if they crash, then them hurting themselves is very likely. So it is, smart and important to acknowledge that if you have that fear response that you feel into it and see okay why is the brain sensing fear in the first place so i'd like to share my top three reasons why i see that most people i've worked with in the past have sensed fear and this is i'd say about 80 percent of the riders i work with um, one of these is, or several of these, is the reason why they're sensing fear. The first one is that they haven't practiced enough to automatize the skills they actually need for a section at hand. And automatize means that you can automatically do them without thinking about them. And that takes many, 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 many repetitions. And we expect this to be fast. We really, we expect that we're going to do it five times and then I'm going to go out on trail and I'm going to be able to apply it but that's not the case. So people try to 
ride harder terrain than they can at the moment and they try to apply skills that they've just recently learned there and then they're like hmm, why am i scared i just want my fear to go away but the fear is actually there for a good cause because the subconscious senses that you've not yet automatized that skill then the second reason i see is that they don't have a plan b so for example they cannot dismount safely from their bike when it's steep and loose so the brain knows okay if i ride into this i have to ride it till the end and if for example you're not excellent at braking like here in these loose conditions then you will sense fear and that's a legitimate fear because you know that it's going to be out of control and if you can't dismount safely isn't it healthy to feel fear and then the third main reason I see is that they mistake surviving trails in the past with being able to ride them. That only if you've gotten down a trail in the past, like let's say I've ridden five black trails, it never felt good, but I've always survived them, that then you're like, okay, now I can ride black trails. But just because you survive them doesn't mean that you actually have the abilities to ride them. And that's the main reason that I see both when I'm watching videos or also when I'm walk, uh, working with riders of all levels, that most people ride way beyond the level they're actually at because it's just promoted either through social media or through trail parks, getting more and more difficult, adding more and more features. We just work our way up and then at some point we notice, oh crap, I've actually been riding with fear for a few weeks now. And the, that's why I wanted to address these three reasons because they are so, so common. And don't judge yourself if you have been doing this because I certainly did so the first years. In contrast, just acknowledge it and start working on your skills in a structured manner, in a safe way. Or if you say, okay, I don't actually want to improve my skills. I just want to have fun riding, then decrease the difficulty of your trails and start to enjoy riding at your pace in the terrain you like. Just because social media or the trail parks or anything out there throws this stuff at, at us, we don't need to ride it and we don't, we don't have to jump, we don't have to do nose pivots or we don't have to do crazy tricks just to be a real mountain biker. We can just have a mellow ride with friends by the seaside if that's what makes our soul or that's what nourishes our soul. And I think, it's important to just listen into that. Okay, of course, there are different reasons like a fear of heights or a past trauma or that you're just simply too stressed on that, day, on that day. So your brain is already in a stress or a fear mode or that you're hungry or tired. And therefore in step one, where your brain is, step, is checking for the resources, your brain says, hey, stop, I don't have the resources. Here's an example of a couple I coached. She'd been riding with him for a lot of years and they actually also rode black trails in the, in the past and she always survived them, but she actually always felt fearful on them. So when they were out riding and she felt fearful and she was like, oh no, I don't want to ride this trail. He said, hey, you've ridden much harder stuff before, so you got this, but she just never felt in control. So they took one or two skill clinics in where they're from and uh, then they came to visit me and work with me and we worked together for five days and we focused on the fundamental skills and I noticed that they were lacking a foundation of the solid stance of braking of dismounting so of course she was not feeling in control on those trails she had already ridden because she knew if I ride into that section, I have to ride it because I can't dismount my bike. She knew that if it gets too steep, that at some point she'll lose control because she didn't have that braking control. She knew that she didn't have the positioning of her body really fine tuned. So she knew that when it got loose, that one of her wheels would probably start skidding and she didn't like that feeling. So. He often motivated her into doing things that he didn't actually know the dangers of. And she did crash also a few times. And of course, this just kept bringing her into this negative, the negative fear loop. And it's a legitimate fear because when we started working on the tools and on the skills, we noticed that she didn't have them. And she, just because she survived the trails didn't mean that she 
was actually getting better because she was just automatizing those habits that were causing the fear in the first place. So the smartest thing you can do if you are noticing that you feel fearful on trails and you have the feeling that you're losing control is to start practicing in a safe learning zone. And if you'd like to do that with me, then I now have a four week program for you where you have over 65 really fun drills and we have several live webinars where I'm gonna help you build a practice habit that actually works and that one that you can actually integrate into your life afterwards, because that's what matters. It's about finding a habit that suits you, finding one that you'll actually enjoy doing and finding one that works for you and also having fun so not seeing practicing as a chore to do but finding drills that really refine your skills refine your coordination refine your anticipation and of course your body positioning and everything that belongs to writing technical sections and then starting to practice regularly because that's what builds skills practice brings progress but most people they just practice too little and that's why now I have this live program coming. We're starting in the middle of March. You're going to find it below in the description. The thing is, why do we believe that we can just take a magic pill and stop feeling fearful? If the cause for our fear is very often that we're not in control of our bike. You know, fear is healthy. It's that superpower of your brain to keep you safe. And let me tell you, the solution is to work with the fear and not against it. Of course, I do have a course because I'm a psychological counselor and also a mental trainer and a neuromental trainer. And I have really specialized on fear and especially fear of heights. And I have tools that work beautifully for fear and they can help you ease fear in only one or two sessions. But if the cause for your fear is still there, then it doesn't help to ease that fear. It's actually very dangerous. So look into that why. Am I really in control? How much have I practiced in this safe zone to automatize the movement? And do I have a plan B? Like, can I dismount safely that I can actually try this section or session this section several times and feel in control and be honest to yourself because what we think we can ride or what we think we should ride is very very often way beyond our limit and we just need to be honest to ourselves so if you don't feel in control then probably you're not in control so be brave enough to own your own fears it is much braver to own your fears and to respect your boundaries than to push past them and to get hurt Motivation and confidence are good, but true bravery, in my opinion, is not riding something if you know you're not going to ride it in control. True bravery is finding your way to ride, setting your boundaries, investing in your skills, caring for yourself and owning your ride, your health, and most of all, your mental health. I'm serious. Just think of it. If you're fearful and you do ride the section and then crash, the long-term consequences are crap. But if you're fearful and you decide not to ride it, the long-term consequence is maybe, yeah, you're judging yourself for not riding it, but you can ride again tomorrow and you can choose whether you want to judge yourself or not, right? So the lesson learned in self-empathy and authenticity is much more valuable than riding the section and risking the crash, or isn't it? Let me share three tips to enable this and um, this comes from my 14 years of full-time coaching experience coaching riders from beginner to olympic pros number one is your vibe attracts your tribe so look for a group of people who really vibe with you the true you that you that is fearful sometimes. This will be your fertile soil to let go of the fear because you need to accept it in order to be able to release it. Environment always trumps willpower. So finding the right environment, finding the right crowd is key. Number two is embrace the process, not only the progress. So start practicing and own your ride. Own your own process, own your safety. Progress will then come as a result. Number three is let your soul 
not your ego decide what and how you should ride. Is this ride today nourishing my soul or is it feeding my ego? Really ask yourself that question. Am I nourishing my soul or feeding my ego? And listen to the soul. Often what we think we need is not what we actually need. And what we think we must ride is not what we're able to ride and what we should be riding today. Just listen to yourself, check in with yourself, because that, in my opinion, in a world today where we're always distracted, is real bravery and real confidence, is knowing what you need. At the end of the day, there are five pillars to riding trails safely and without fear. These five pillars are coordination, strength, mindset, skills, and flexibility. So you need to allow yourself to build a coordination. That's why I have that four week live program coming for, so check the link before. We start on March 16th. You need to build the strength and endurance so your brain in step one will know, okay, your body has the resources. You need the mindset to believe in yourself, but also to know your limits, to know when you need to practice to be safe. And that growth mindset, that accepting that and owning your ride is and own, owning your fears, owning yourself, owning your everything. That's the fertile soil for growth. Without being open to learn and look at what's holding you back, the plants you plant, they cannot grow. And then the next pillar is you need the skills. And these are not built just by riding. They're built by structured practice of the right movements. And I'd love to work with you on that because no, you will not build them in one or two days in a group skills clinic. That's just the beginning of building. Just like no one learns a language within a day or two. You need consistent practice and you can save a lot of time if you just follow my proven drills. The same drills actually I share with my one-on-one -on -one clients when they come just that you actually have enough time to automatize them because you can do them from home. And then the next pillar is flexibility. So you need that range of motion in your limbs to actually execute moments, which is why I have a flexibility course specifically for mountain bikers, also linked below. And these are the five pillars of success at mountain biking. Let me repeat that. That is coordination, strength and endurance, mindset, skills and flexibility. And once you have the five pillars all at a pretty good level, that's when your supercomputer brain will note, wow, I'm stable. But if one of the pillars is wobbly, of course it's gonna give you fear and self-doubt when you try to push past your limits without leveling up one of these pillars. Yeah, that's all I've got for you today. I hope you found this helpful. Sending you a much love. Goodbye.